I've gotten out of it as much as I think I've offered back. Hi, hello, and hi again. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast, presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's unleashing creativity to grow their business. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing dude at Hippo Direct, and you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com for any help with podcasting or digital marketing. This is episode number 43, and today's guest is Mark Friedman. He's the chief marketing and digital officer of Amerimark and previously served as a president of e-commerce at Steve Madden and the CMO of Brooks Brothers. He's experienced firsthand both the booming rise of e-commerce and the devastating downfall of traditional retail in what's now known as the retail apocalypse. You'll hear all about that, plus the perks of having a mentor and being a mentor. It is Mark. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Mark Friedman, the e-commerce changing landscape of retail expert. That's your new title. We just made it up. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for hosting us at your beautiful home in Westfield, New Jersey. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. Of course. Yeah, having a blast already. But uh, we, we have some crazy connections that I want to get out of the way first. So, so first, my amazing girlfriend, Dana, who once again paid me to say that. She uh, she's very good friends with your amazing daughter Dana. So we got Dana's everywhere. We do. Yeah. Also, you are just a block or two maybe away from from my cousins and aunt and uncle Cliff, Lori, Josh, Sam, their house just down the street here in Westfield. So I used to come here all the time for Thanksgiving every single year gr- growing up. Of course, back then I didn't know you existed, so that was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of crazy. Funny. Uh, but you were just playing golf with uh, my uncle Cliff this morning. So pretty sure. Um, a lot of those things contributed to this interview, so absolutely. And, uh, Here we are. He played well today, so uh, we and we were on the same team. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so we can we can do a second edition that's more of a golf recap. But <laughs> but for now, I mean, you are you're the chief marketing digital officer at Amerimark. Uh, you've had experience, president of e-commerce at Steve Madden. You've been the CMO of Brooks Brothers. Very prestigious positions in the marketing world and a lot of the world in this changing world of retail, but. Uh, for anybody that's not too familiar yet, you mind giving a little bit intro of your background and how you got up to the things that you're doing today? Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, I got my start in uh, in accounting. I was an auditor for one of the big eight in those days, accounting firms. Big eight. And, yeah, <laughs> Touche Ross. And you know, I came out of school thinking I wanted to be an accountant and and moving into auditing. And you know, certainly realized after a few years that that was not the way I wanted to spend my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I had an opportunity for one of my clients uh, to go work for. Well, one of my clients uh, was a company called Popular Club Plan, and they were the initial um, founders and developers of the business called J Crew. Mm. Um, and I met some of the people there. They ultimately were going off, and this is in the late 80s, they were going off to develop their own private label catalog business. They had venture capital funding. It was one of the first catalogs to be venture capital funded. And they asked me to come and join them. I was the fourth employee um, as a controller. Wow. Uh, which was great uh, because it gave me the opportunity to move into a business. And although it was still accounting and finance, um, I thought maybe it would give me the opportunity to do something you know different. Mm-hmm. Fast forward after a couple of years, I moved into catalog marketing. Uh, the name of the business was called Tweeds. And you know, I honestly knew nothing about anything uh, related to catalog. <laughs> you knew nothing about anything. I, I knew, yeah. Well, know, that's I, a good I, place to start. Then. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately learned how to decide how you mail catalogs and to mm-hmm. whom you mail and how frequently you mail. Spent seven or I guess it was nine years uh, in the Tweeds uh, business, taking on broader responsibilities. And then we got acquired by a company called Hanover Direct. And from my time at Tweeds, once I moved into marketing, the rest of my career was was catalog and marketing mm. based. And then ultimately, uh, four-wall retail and digital based. Wow. So what is it about marketing that's, what's been the glue? What has kept you in the world of marketing where you've experienced some of these other lines of business? I think the fact that, you know, I got involved in it kind of by happenstance, but what was good for me is that I'm fairly analytical. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I, when I interview people, I ask them about, you know, if you have two uh, on the spectrum of 
being analytical versus being creative right. as people where they are. Um, I clearly am I'm more on the analytical side. Yeah. Well, you've been analyzing this interview like crazy. No. <laughs> and then, you know, from a marketing point of view, certainly creative and, and branding is a big part of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, being able to measure and understand, you know, what can you spend to acquire customers? Um, you know, where is the, the ROI on just about anything that you're investing in? So having that background has really, you know, lent itself to being, you know, having a good marketing career. Mm, right. And when you think about these these different companies you've been at, there's a wide range of companies, but um, a lot of the stuff that you've done has been in the e-commerce world and this digital world and sort of the newer world of, of marketing and online retail. What, what's been the biggest learning curve with this new line of ways to market things? Well, you know, I was lucky because I had a lot of friends that were in the catalog business that were not able to make, um, didn't have the opportunity or weren't able to make the change into digital marketing. I was lucky that mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the job that I took at Brooks Brothers was uh, in 2000 and was my first opportunity to move into something that was beyond just catalog. Mm. Um, we had, uh, they brought me in as the general manager of the catalog and the web business. It was a nascent web business at the time. Um, and then ultimately um, doing the marketing for the stores. But I guess your question was, what was the, what, what have I learned about the differences? Yeah, is it, what's been the, a lot of the stuff that you're doing now and that a lot of online marketers are doing these days didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. What's been the biggest challenge with adopting this new technology? Yeah, and, and I, maybe I would answer it and say that although there are lots of challenges and we can talk about those, mm -hmm. there are some pretty significant consistencies. You know, catalog, it's just a different medium. You're sending a book um, right. in the mail to somebody. You're targeting them specifically. If they're your customer, you're prospecting for them if they're not. But you can, you know, all the metrics and all the analytics of who buys and what the, the list you send out. I, I know this mm -hmm. is your family. Yeah, business, exactly. Right? Yeah. The, the, list you, you, the list you send out, um, you know, you're able to tell uh, whether it was a good list or not for your business. Right. The challenge is, you know, in, in the web, this whole concept of attribution, mm -hmm. um, you know, you spend a dollar um, in a particular marketing channel. And then being able to determine if you did get a sale, what was the driver of that sale? Yes. Was it the fact that a customer saw your ad on at being retargeted or did they get a marketing email from you or did mm -hmm. they receive a catalog from you or did they see something on a billboard or, or a TV ad or what have you? So attribution, you know, is a big challenge for us. And, and now in the company that I'm in um, at Amerimark, um, we're very heavily uh, catalog mailers still, um, mm -hmm. and we use that. The, we, we use the catalogs to drive traffic, you know, to the web. Yeah, as it, and as you mentioned at Hippo Direct, that's something we're huge into too. In terms of attribution, what's the biggest way that you're able to find out what actually points to the success of a campaign? In the scenario where the customer and, and customers don't shop this way, when you know, I'll come back to this, but mm -hmm. um, you know, when a customer clicks on a paid search ad in Google and then they come to your site and buy, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. It's one right. one click in the journey, and you know that um, from that paid search, you got a, an, an ad, uh, you got a sale. The challenge has been from when I've started, you know, and when I started in digital, Yahoo was actually the search engine. Oh, you know, Google was a baby. Remember those days? Yeah. It, <laughs> still around, but I, I think the landscape has changed a yeah, little bit with Google. Bit. Yeah. And so, you know, now what happens is there are so many different marketing channels digitally that a consumer can see your ads, whether it's emails, paid search, mm -hmm. natural search, could be direct load. It could be retargeting or affiliate marketing or, or email. And now make matters worse mm -hmm. with the, the continued evolution of traffic from desktop to mobile. That even plays a havoc with, with making decisions. Um, and, and the fact is so many customers, and it's not just millennials, so many customers are shopping first on their desktop. Then they're going out to a store and using their mobile device. When I was right. at Steve Madden, I would stand in our stores and watch people look at shoes, pick up the shoes, see what the price of the shoe was. Mm -hmm. And right in front of, you know, the sales associates and me, you yeah. know, they'd go on to, you know, to Google and use a product listing ad search. <laughs> and, you know, they, they'd buy a pair of shoes from somebody else um, that might have been selling Madden and, you know, for a lower price. Well, <laughs> these days, how do you decide how much your efforts to devote to mobile versus desktop? 
Yeah, so I, I think in our case, it's less of devoting the effort, mm-hmm. um, and it's more of letting you know the, the customer decides where they're going to, what tool they're going to use to get there. Clearly, the millennials, you know, you fall into that. My two kids fall Guilty. into that. Right? <laughs> Guilty um, as charged. You know, so you're you're glued to your your mobile phone, mm-hmm. and and the capabilities of the mobile phones, you know, now are making it so much easier for you to yeah. shop. Well, there may, I mean, there are many computers basically. Yeah, there are many laptops. Though. You know, they're they're not as easy to browse. You know, I think it's more of a situation where yeah. you kind of know what you want, so you mm-hmm. go on your mobile device and you execute it. Um, on the desktop, you know, our customers are browsing; they're being able to see quicker and faster um, the wide array of products that you know you have as a retailer. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's get into this world of e-commerce. So you mentioned some things about digital earlier. What's been the biggest thing that has kept you in this e-commerce or digital world as a focus? Because you, you spoke earlier about what you like about marketing. Well, what is it about the digital and online part of marketing that's kept your interest for, for these years? The fact that it changes um, almost every week, um, that you have to have a... Uh, I'm not a tech guy. Um, I, 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 I say mm-hmm. that in all the conversations. <laughs> I'm not the tech guy. I'm you seem to know your way around a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my kids, they would probably not agree with you. But um, <laughs> so I, I like the fact that the, the technology, you know, continues to evolve. I like learning about it. Um, you know, this this whole concept of of taking you know e-commerce uh, hosting into the cloud, um, you know, was kind of this bubble where you know so many businesses now, are, as opposed to having you know boxes of servers, you know, um, that you have to manage. Yeah, um, you know, doing it at a at an AWS and an Amazon Web Services or in, in other their other competitors just makes it so much easier to execute. You can scale up and down yeah. as necessary. So I, I think the fact that it's a constantly evolving game mm-hmm. um, that's somewhat, you know, it's com- competition, you know, it's competitive for me yeah. um, is what, what I really like. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned the cloud piece. Uh, it was down uh, earlier this year in, in Florida and... My grandpa was down. Who he turns tw- ninety five. I, nice. I almost said twenty five. <laughs> he turns ninety five later this year, and was reading the Wall Street Journal and saw the term cloud computing. And he looks up and he asks, asks Cliff. Actually, he goes, "What is cloud computing?" <laughs> and it just kind of like struck me as you know, to a ninety five year old, that is something that's completely foreign, completely out of this world. But it's made people's jobs so much easier. It's made storage so much easier. Um, it's it's such an interesting thing. So that's just one example of how drastically things change and for a 95-year-old, how <laughs> hard that concept is to grasp. But what other big ways stick out to you for how specifically e-commerce, how e-commerce has changed since when you first got into it to now? Because um, uh, well, obviously it's growing and growing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, the, the other thing that definitely has changed is and, and not all companies are taking advantage of, of some of these capabilities, but the ability to personalize and segment a website mm-hmm. um, based upon the customer's prior experience, um, the ability to test things on a, on a website, do A-B tests. And um, you know, we yeah. were actually this week um, meeting with um, one of our, our vendor partners who does exactly that um, and being able to say, you know, so... Um, you know, Mark Friedman comes to the site. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say um, we we know in the past that he's bought golf equipment, and maybe we're a business that sells you know golf or other sporting goods as well. Well, you know, based on his last purchase or his some history, you know, let's make sure we show him golf when he gets to the the homepage of the site. Right. Um, I know that sounds very simplistic, but you'd be surprised mm-hmm. how many companies are not doing that. Yeah. Not, not tailoring their email communications to you. Not tailoring. Um, your visits to the site and yeah. it makes a difference. Yeah. And I can't tell you, I'm sure you see it all the time on the back end. And as, as just a general consumer seeing this, how many times that you go to a site and then next thing you know, you know, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, oh, yeah. you're on one of these sites and you already have an ad from them. So, so a friend of mine was telling me this week, she, um, she was on a, on her mobile device, I think mm-hmm. business was title nine. And she was saying, you know what? 
before I thought about Title IX, in my newsfeed, there was a Title IX remarketing ad there. <laughs> um, and it's really the way it's, it's changing. I mean, look at Alexa, you know, or, um, yeah. or, or the Google. Do you, know, Google. do you have a speaker device? Is she going to come on in a second? Oh, she, <laughs> might. <laughs> she might, yeah. <laughs> no, well, no, the, other, have, the other one, the G1. We, we have a special guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you know the, the ability to interact with those kinds of devices and then, you know, have products show up you know, at your doorstep, um, yeah. that stuff is just continues to evolve. Mm-hmm. And what I find so intriguing about the space. Yeah. yeah. And at your doorstep and, and we'll see where it's, you know, at the, at the time of this recording, there's some stuff and some videos going around and, you know, Amazon's been testing out drone delivery and that sort of thing, but we'll see time. will tell over the next few years, how widespread that gets. And if we're truly going to have packages flying around and into windows <laughs> and stuff like that. So that's a whole nother, uh, can of worms, can of packages, but what can companies do? So let's do like a, a case example. If you are a, a retail company that's starting to sell, sell stuff online through your own website, what are some key pointers for things that you can do that are essential to succeed in the e-commerce world? There's a couple of obvious pieces. I mean, first of all, you've got to be able to build your brand. So, you know, if you mm-hmm. have a brand already, um, you know, then, you know, building the site is more mechanical and tactics. But, you know, if you're a startup business and you don't have um, a brand, getting a website up and running nowadays is fairly simple. Uh-huh. Um, there's a number of companies that, um, you know, Shopify and, you know, they have a, a tool yeah. Shopify, Shopify Plus, great. Yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of, um, of retailers, they are putting people in, in the e-commerce business, uh, almost overnight. So, you know, if you, if you have to build your brand, mm-hmm. um, I think more and more social, um, is playing a big, big part. So whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, um, you know, especially Instagram and, and Facebook, how they, how they have evolved their businesses. Yeah. Um, really and helps the advertising model in that yeah yeah it, it really helps to um to allow for early stage companies <laughs> to fairly efficiently drive new customers mm-hmm. and if, if you were to make a guess on the future of e-commerce like if you were to make a guess over the next few years trends that are happening in that e-commerce space anything that comes to mind well certainly mm-hmm. all the ai stuff that's happening all the artificial intelligence um, stuff that's happening is going to continue to, to make a big deal. You know, I've seen some virtual uh, virtual reality things that are absolutely incredible. Yeah, um, that are happening now. It's not. It, it's no longer. You know, it's going to be. You know, twenty twenty five and twenty twenty. We are going to see. You know, you and I yeah. are going to be able to interact. Um, this with, whole interview could have been virtual reality. <laughs> yeah. You know, but next year, I, I think um, you're going to see a ton of things. Gartner just put out a study about um, AI and, and virtual reality mm-hmm. and, and how it's, you know, basically 2020 is it's coming out year. Yeah. And have you toyed with any of those in your professional career? Or is this uh, more on no, the side? Not at, not at Amerimark, um, mm-hmm. not even really at Madden very much. But um, in the I spent a year consulting um, on my own in between um, leaving Madden and, and joining Amerimark. Um, and I worked with uh, two companies that are early stage that are looking to be able to help retailers uh, mm-hmm. in virtual reality. Basically, walk into a store, take an image of a 360 view of all of the product that's in the store and mm-hmm. basically put it up in a, in a digital experience and allow yeah. customers almost to insert themselves in the center of the store and make a purchase. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah. it's And you don't need uh, crazy glasses for it. <laughs> right. Well, that's the key. That's like the biggest barrier right now is the crazier the glasses are. <laughs> if you got those big giant things, then it's kind of, it's a huge hurdle to entry. But once, as it gets smoothed out, you know, people talk about once it comes into contact lenses for them, things like that, then it can become really, really widespread once people get used to it. What's your take? I'm kind of like, so the other side of the things in the strictly offline space, as far as brick and mortar retail, and I'm sure you've heard the term retail apocalypse all the time. I mean, There's news and I see it on LinkedIn, you know, with their daily news updates all the time of how many brick and mortar stores and traditional retail outlets that have been huge names in the space. You know, we saw it with Toys R Us. You see like the list goes on and on and on. What's your reaction to seeing those things when you see all these giant brands just have to close thousands and thousands of stores? Yeah. First of all, it's sad Mm -hmm. um, for sure. 
Um, I still don't understand how Toys R Us with the kind of brand name and, and brand awareness that they had over the years couldn't figure out a model to be a much smaller business and yeah. and sustain um, what they had. Right. Um, or sustain a business, not necessarily to the scale that they had. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, also you look at Amazon and we, we talked earlier about the drones and, you know, in, in the day, you know, people would sit around and say, geez, how are we going to place uh, an order today and gang it all up? So that we can get over the shipping hurdle and yeah. only have one, you know, one one amount to get over. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, you open up your mobile phone when you wake up in the morning and you don't have toilet paper, so you press a button and the toilet paper shows up. Two hours later, you realize <laughs> you're out of milk. You press another button and the milk shows up, right. and without any thought about shipping and handling. So that's mm-hmm. changed, you know, a big part of the landscape. Retail, I think, part of what hasn't kept up um, is, you know, customer service. I really believe still matters. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I love shopping at Nordstrom because um, I feel for the most part, there are people that are that are knowledgeable about the products. I had an experience years ago where um, I bought a pair of pants at Nordstrom and um, they weren't quite right um, in the length after they were hemmed. And the person got on his belly and stood behind me to see whether <laughs> or not they were really, you know, uh, level. That kind of customer service doesn't really exist in mm-hmm. many, many stores. And I think that's hurt retail. And I also think, it has. you know, I, I think the, back to what I like about my space and the analytics, mm-hmm. I think retailers have been very, very slow to leverage the data that they have about customers. Mm-hmm. You know, customer, these big retailers have had private label credit cards for years. That was, should have been an awesome tool for them to know if I had the card, they knew you know, there was a reason for me to have that card, to use that card, to build brand loyalty, and then to market me differently than other people. Yeah. And they were very, very, and many of them, very slow to use that information. Mm-hmm. When you think about your career, what stands out as some of the, some of the biggest aha moments that you've discovered working in this space? Like what are memorable moments as far as that you've really got things clicking, building a brand in this online and digital space? Um, I'll go way back in the days when... Please uh, do. (laughs) Yeah, well, I I do go way back. You can tell by the... No, no, no. Not at all. When I was uh, acquired, when I was at Tweeds and we were acquired by this business called Hanover Direct, I eventually moved into one of the other portfolio brands called The Company Store. And The Company Store had been bought out of bankruptcy in the late 80s, I guess, and um, no, um, I guess sometime in the in the early '90s. We'll, we'll put like a, a circa. On yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> and the nice part of that business, when I got involved, it was uh, it had been previously a family owned business. Um, it was down comforters and pillows, and the the creative was great. The product was great. It was assembled in in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I had moved into that business as the VP of marketing and my job was all the catalog circulation and get the book into the hands of of the customers. I had spent the prior year in the parent company building what I'll call a unified database. We took all these businesses that we own, there were eight or 10 of them, and created this unified database so that if Mark Friedman had bought across multiple brands, Mm -hmm. we didn't have that all put in one easy to use tool. Well, we spent a year bringing it together, stitching together, much like you have to do today, stitching together Mark in company one and in company two and in company Mm -hmm. four. And having built that database, once I got into the company store, we were able to leverage what I had learned in that database. We grew that business in three years from 40 million to $140 million. And we grew EBITDA uh, as a percentage of, of net sales each of the years. Um, so that was the single best time, I guess, from a, um, a financial perspective in my career. People would say to me, geez, you know, how did you do that? Yeah. And, and well, I, you stole my next question. Well, <laughs> I, I used to say to folks, we had great product, great creative. Mm-hmm. We executed well on customer service and distribution. And so long as the marketing guys didn't screw it up, we were going to be successful. And, there we go. One and, of those darn marketers you got to watch out for. Them. <laughs> you know, and and in those days, you know, we were able to mail the phone book, and it was now that's a throwback. Now. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, you remember when there was a phone book? Yeah, um, and there was no web. You know, so this was um, you know early '90s. We were just getting started. Um, I guess it was late '90s now, because when I left mm-hmm. there, I went to Brooks Brothers in 2000. 
you know, and that's a business, you know, back to you, you, you ask about other things. Yeah. You know, that's a business where when I started, they had a team that was focused on the full price retail stores. Mm-hmm. Then they had a team focused on the factory outlet retail stores. And then we had a catalog slash web team. <laughs> everybody hated everybody else. Every <laughs> channel viewed the other channel as competition. That's a recipe for something. <laughs> you know, and you know, this whole concept of silos and, and the silos, mm-hmm. you know, still exist in businesses that are catalog and web, you know, you know, unless they have been, you know, well integrated, you know, you, you still have catalog folks who think that the web is, is cannibalizing their business. Mm-hmm. When in fact the catalog is one of the most significant drivers um, to the web business uh, in those situations. <laughs> it is indeed. And it's, it's just, it's, it's crazy to think about so many different, you know, silos like that and everybody's kind of going against each other within the same company, but it does stuff like that happens all the time. Yeah. And, it, and what's amazing is that, you know, after having been, you know, focused in digital now for the last almost 15 years mm-hmm. um, and then over the course of my consulting yeah. and, and even well, now. Well before Facebook, by the way. <laughs> oh, well before that. Yeah, any app. And TikTok. You, know, you still walk into these businesses and, and they're still, you know, structured in a silo kind of a way. <laughs> hey, wild listeners. Have you been wanting to start a podcast for yourself or your business, but didn't know where to start? Or do you have a podcast of your own, but you're struggling with the time commitment? I'd love to help. Shoot me an email at max at hippodirect.com with any podcasting questions you have. I'm also happy to jump on a 30-minute call where we can discuss your idea, planning, production, promotion, and other elements of the podcasting world. Let your podcast run wild. On a slightly different note, so I know in addition to your to your full-time jobs, you've done a lot of advising and a lot of mentoring to to other business professionals. And so what tips do you have in that regard? So from the mentor side, not the mentee side, right. any advice you can share there? Yeah, um, I, I've loved doing that. It's just something I, I like to feel like I give back. And, you know, I've got a lot of, uh, there's lots of, um, you know, things, information that I can help folks with. And what I've learned, I've gotten out of it as much as I think I've offered back. Um, there is most of the early stage folks are early in their uh, career. Um, mm-hmm. though every once in a while you'll see somebody who's more seasoned. Um, but it's basically, you know, uh, folks from, you know, 21 right out of college to 30 or, you know, early thirties, um, <laughs> their ability to stay focused on the prize, um, is incredible. I, I don't know that I would have had at that age, uh, the stick to that, um, that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in almost every situation that I've been in, in these mentoring things, mm-hmm. um, folks are having to pivot along the way. They come in with an idea. They think they know what it mm-hmm. is, what problem they're trying to solve. And then as time progresses, they realize that maybe it's not quite what they thought it was. So either they can't get the business off the ground. People don't want to buy it. They don't want to pay for it. And then they yeah. have to maneuver. Um, I don't know that of, of the four or five companies that I've seriously mentored, I'm not sure one, uh, I, I, maybe one kind of got some reasonable scale at what they started with. <laughs> well, it's just crazy to think about. How do you come into contact with these companies? How, how do you establish yourself as a mentor? You, you don't exactly just stand on a mountain and go, I'm a mentor, you know, come here. <laughs> no, um, it's all networking. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned before I had consulted for a year, um, mm-hmm. you know, all that came from was, you know, be, being a good um, uh, connector of people, of people that I know in the industry, staying in touch with people that I, I've come across with um, in the industry. And the mentor, the, the more formal aspect of the mentoring is with uh, an organization called XRC Labs. Uh, they started, I think, in, in 2015. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a, um, a, an individual who partnered with Parsons School in New York City um, and a few other organizations. And uh, they're now uh, taking applications for their eighth cohort. And basically what they do is every six months they have a new cohort. So they, they just finished uh, their seventh one. Um, and I participated as a mentor. So what they do is they make a small investment in a company, in one mm-hmm. of these eight companies in, in each cohort. And then they try to partner two or three or four mentors with the, the founders. They go through a 12-week intensive, how am I getting my business off the ground? And as part of that, I would work with them and help them um, you know, think about 
what they were doing from a marketing point of view. Um, and it's been great. Um, you know, I've, I've taken a couple of small investments uh, mm-hmm. in a few of them, the ones where they felt like I could help them and yeah. where I connected. And, um, you know, they've done nicely. So it's been great. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's so cool that you've done that. I love that you've done that because it's really, you have so much knowledge to share. And, and you hear that from time to time is obviously people that are looking for mentors. There's a lot that they, there's a lot that they can gain from the mentors, but more often than not, it really benefits the mentor as well. And as you've said it yourself, there's so much that you can gain from the mentee as well. It's such a strong thing that I think more people can benefit from. So that's cool that you've... Uh, yeah, absolutely. You're and, and you're right. That. I've gotten a lot out of it. Um, mm-hmm. and I don't mean economically. I mean, it's helped right. me to stay in touch with people earlier in their career. Yeah. It's allowed me to see you know, firsthand new technologies that are out there that I ordinarily wouldn't have had that opportunity. Right. Yeah. Like these drones that are flying. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's one at the front door now. Yeah, probably. Uh, it's more toilet paper coming in. <laughs> so let's switch gears to a segment on inspiration and creativity. So first question here, very, very specific. No, it's a very, very general question. What do you do to stay creative? Well, um, I think some of it is the mentoring uh, that we just talked about. So mm-hmm. I, I take inspiration um, from the things that they're doing. Um, I go to conferences. Um, actually, uh, in March, was at a great conference that's early in their uh, in their uh, being. It's called Shop Talk. They do it every March in, um, in Vegas. Um, they're bringing together, uh, I think they had 8,000 people between vendors and, and marketers and people in our space. Holy moly. Um, and, you know, they're getting, you know, real senior people uh, mm-hmm. to go up on stage and talk about things like we're talking about, what inspires them, how they stay creative, yeah. Um, so, you know, doing those types of things. Um, I read a lot about, you know, things that are in our space. And I also, and, and this is getting you know harder and harder to do, um, you know, I get tons of cold calls and emails and phone calls and not so much snail mail anymore, um, mm-hmm. you know, of people that are trying to sell me things. Yeah. And I'm, I've always been very sensitive not to waste people's time uh, yeah. to take meetings unless I'm serious about it. Right. Well, rather. thank you for being so serious about this interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I will, um, you know, take a meeting um, if there's something that's interesting um, that will get me an opportunity to learn a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, what I try to always position it, it may not be relevant for me today from the vendor's perspective, mm-hmm. um, but you never know who I can introduce them to if I like what, they're, what they do. Or right. maybe eventually I'm going to, to need them. Um, and that's kind of what yeah, I was you talking. never know. You, yeah. you never know the, the networking I referred to before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a big part of where I think my if I if I have been successful, I'd say a lot of it had to do with that. Yeah, well, there's so much you can learn from other people, and it's you truly never know when you know a connection that you meet now is going to come into play 15 years from now. So you really never know, especially with the landscape of everything changing. You mentioned reading. What do you like to read? Well, I used to read the newspaper, but don't read mm-hmm. the newspaper anymore. No? Uh, you, you've switched to online or you switched away from the news, newspaper? Uh, I read them online. I, I'm still a, uh, I'm a big sports fan, so I still read mm-hmm. the, the daily yeah. news sports section online. Of course. <laughs> um, but a lot of um, you know the trade um, you know kinds of uh, magazines. I actually like reading the Harvard Business Review, um, which is great from a, a leadership um, yeah. perspective. They do some technology stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bunch of online sites, Retail Dive and Chain Store um, Retail or Chain Store Age. Even USA Today has a bunch of uh, really good tech stuff. But, you know, I, I have a lot of push, information pushed to me each day. Um, I'll scan it. And if I find something mm-hmm. you know that's interesting, um, oftentimes I'll share it with my team as well. Yeah. In terms of reading, how about, do you ever read fiction books or things that are totally different from the business or, or sports world? I, I really, you know, I, I, I was never a big reader mm-hmm. and I wish I was. And now as time has progressed and the iPad and, um, you know, I really don't go anywhere without my, my tablet. Mm-hmm. Um, and although I, obviously I could read books on it, um, I'd much rather, <laughs> right. you know, just go to sites and, and apps and, yeah. and things and get my news, uh, you know, that way. And it's, you know, it's self-education as well. Totally. Yeah. It's, that's what I love. And that's part of why I love podcasts so much is because there's so much you can learn from it. Like there's so many amazing resources for learning these days. So talk about self-education, like we're this content age, whatever you want to call it is an incredible age for that. It's, Mm. it's sometimes it's overloading. Um, 
but you know, right. I, you have actually, to be selective. Certainly. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, we talked earlier about me leveraging technology. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, and maybe I've listened, started listening to podcasts mm-hmm. for the last couple well, of years. Well, this is it. You, you have like a wild business growth tattoo on your left arm. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well you know, up until uh, a few months ago, I hadn't heard about yours and you you know, I've been, uh, you know, listening ever since. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate it. And you know, for too long, we've come full circle uh, with this interview, but how about, hobbies you know, in addition to soaking up information that way uh what do you like to do with your free time play a lot of golf yeah um, and right I play even lo- today <laughs> and i play a lot of golf i wish i was better um but i do that um we travel um as well mm-hmm. um, you mean as a family or, or work travel I, I do some travel for work now um we've done you know a, a bunch not as much as i probably would have liked as a family we were in israel uh last year and um mm-hmm. we also go to florida uh quite a bit Yep. Um, my kids who are, uh, I have twins that are 25, um, still like traveling with us. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. good. Yeah. yeah. Well, now they've grown out of like the teenage years where they hate you guys. So now it's, now it's okay to travel again. Yeah. yeah. We were <laughs> I know lucky. that first. first they, they, they were, uh, they're, they're good about that. So, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, traveling is, uh, is good. Um, actually I like to shop. Um, I know that sounds yeah. a little weird, but you know, having it makes sense in your industry. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know, it's, it's funny when I worked at Steve Madden um, and I was there for seven years, when I first started to, to get to know Steve, um, he would say to me that, you know, he, he because he's been in, was in the shoe business for so long, he'd walk in a mall and mm-hmm. he couldn't walk with his eyes up, right? Because he was always looking uh, at what shoes people were wearing. And, yes. You know, slowly over time, um, I started to do that. Um, but I, I, I do like going to the mall less to mm-hmm. actually buy but more to see what's the experience like mm-hmm. um, which stores are hot which stores are not um, I, I think that's that helps me understand you know the consumer and how you know he or she may be changing yeah well that curiosity is so important I kind of can mirror that I used to work uh, in brand management in the laundry business and so with detergents and dryer sheets and fabric softeners and all that and once you're in that world, and it applies to any CPG company, once you're in that world, you can never go into grocery store or drugstore or any, you know, pharmacy, anything like that the same way again, because you always have to check the laundry aisle or you can't walk by whatever aisle your brands are in without thinking, oh, that's a new product or, oh, wow, they're doing a big discount there. Like it, it changes your insights. So yeah, for sure. Totally can uh, <laughs> get what Steve is talking about with the shoes there. And how about on the people standpoint? So who's been most influential for you in terms of your professional career? Specific names or just, you know, types it can of be people? Na- yeah, it can be names. Um, the, and, uh, and if we're going to get a cease and desist later, you know, we can, <laughs> we can edit the names out. But <laughs> Yeah, um, th- there's been a, a few. Um, first one um, was this fellow that brought me to Tweeds. Uh, his name is Ted Pamperin. Um, mm-hmm. And it's... Uh, I actually worked for him twice in my career huh. and um, he, he gave me my, my really first start because um, he took me out of accounting and the big eight firm and brought me into uh, this startup as a controller. Um, but then I learned the direct marketing business from him. Um, he had 20 years on me. Um, he had done quite a bit already. He was a very accomplished guy and probably would not have stayed in the space uh, and come up the way I did if it weren't for him. Wow. Um, so that was a, a, a big, he was a big contributor. Um, and then when I got to um, Brooks Brothers, the CEO there is a fellow named Joe Gromack. Um, Joe had spent a bunch of time at Saks. He was a, a merchant and a businessman, um, had an uncanny, kind of like what I like to think I have, you mm-hmm. know, but he had a really uncanny ability to look at a, a sheet of numbers. Mm-hmm. No matter how many numbers were on the page, he could pick out, the one that was wrong or the one that was really the most important one on that piece of paper. <laughs> um, so I worked for him at, at Brooks. Um, and then uh, what's funny is when, I, when when he left Brooks Brothers, we had gotten sold. So a bunch mm-hmm. of people on the executive t- uh, team left. I stayed behind. And then about six months later, I left. And people were asking me, geez, you know, would you work for Joe again? And I'm like, well, I'm not so sure. You know, I don't know. Well, anyway, fast forward a number of years later, mm-hmm. Joe became uh, the CEO of a company called Warnico. We had the license for Calvin Klein underwear, Calvin Klein jeans, and Speedo. And he... And, Which is why I'm wearing a Speedo today. Yeah, great. I'm glad you're wearing something over your Speedo. Uh, <laughs> um, Touche. <laughs> he, 
he uh, called me with um, the head of HR, who was also something somebody we worked together with at Brooks Brothers, mm-hmm. and said, "Hey, you know, we need a digital person. You know, why don't you come and and help us?" So I left my my job and, and went to work uh, at Warnico. So I worked for Joe uh, twice also in my career. Uh, he was also a big mm-hmm. big part of, of bringing me along from a. Um, a marketing and a, and also gave me my first opportunity at Brooks mm-hmm. in four wall retail. Wow! And you're you know you know you're just kind of proving your examples and your 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 statements earlier is that you talked about how important networking is and this network that you've created and your business partners have come. There's several touch points throughout their career where people you know from several years before came back and become your associates again. So it's so important. We're, we're going to test you out at that number thing, though, that you have, you know, an uncanny ability. We're going to have a giant sheet with 100 digits of pi, and you're going to have to pick which one is incorrect. So, <laughs> Not very good in the word search part puzzles, you know, trying to find out the... Yeah. So let's get to a fan favorite section here called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. This is where we talk about a recent campaign that caught our attention, and earlier... There was something involving donuts which caught your attention, and now I'm hungry for donuts, which might be tied to that. But you want to, uh, you mind sharing what you saw? Yeah, and- yeah, it was great. You know, I, I get so many uh, emails um, from companies that I've worked for, or just from others that I uh, get inspiration from. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, I happen to like Dunkin' Donuts coffee now. Dunkin' coffee. Yes, and, very, yeah, they right? concised up their brand Got to change, got to stay with the times. <laughs> and I'm surprised they didn't just go to DD or something like that. Yeah, we actually, now that you brought that up, one of our previous guests, Ann Bastinelli, one of my former marketing professors, that was her example for the Wild Business Shout of the Week. She was on the show previously, and we talked about the change of Duncan. So now we have Wild Business Shout of the Week inception going on. So thank you, Mark. Okay, yeah. <laughs> And so I got this email from Duncan. You know, they were, I get them almost every day, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was by myself. I open it up and I'm like, wow, that's cool, right? And I get a lot of stuff and I don't react that way. But the, the main image in the, in the top of the email was a sneaker that was fully encased in multicolor sprinkles uh, <laughs> that they, you know, that they put on the donuts. So it, it caught my eye. It was very colorful. And I scanned down. And ultimately, you know, they talked about the, this co-branding that they were doing between um, themselves and the uh, footwear company called Saucony. And then also it was, it was all related to the uh, Boston Marathon. It was the second time they, they had done this last year. So they did it again. And it was basically, you know, a mashup of, of three things, two organizations and a thing and an event that happened in the Boston metro area because both Saucony and Duncan are based up there and then obviously the Boston Marathon. And it, it just, it was what I thought was great marketing from the, the sense that it it caught my attention enough that it stood out from the litany of emails that mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. Um, I can't say to you that it made me go buy a donut or that it made me go buy a cup of coffee, yeah. or that it made me go buy a pair of Saucony shoes. Or made you run the marathon. <laughs> For sure, it didn't make me run the marathon. But You're in pretty I, good shape, though. I think yeah. you could do it. <laughs> but I, I just thought that you know, in, in this very difficult climate to cut through the clutter and the noise that's out there, um, they did an amazing job. Yeah, they totally did. And you said it yourself, it literally made you say, wow, that's cool. Uh, so it really stood out to you. It wasn't just, oh, okay. But, you know, we, we do a lot of work in email as well. So we do a lot of stuff with email message copy and, and what stands out and, and what doesn't. From your perspective, what what are some of the most important things that make things stand up to you? So make, make, that make emails stand out to you. So in this example, it was the image. Is there anything else you can think of? Oh, well, certain goes, subject lines, um, you know, catch your yeah. attention. Well, it's the first thing you see, so. It's, it's the first thing you Even see. Even if you don't open it. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, there's all kinds of schools of thought about, you know, should they be long? Should they be short? You know, should they, you know, if, you, if you're offering something, you know, if you're giving free shipping or if you're giving a percent off, mm-hmm. should you include it in there? Should you get it, you know, make it a tease um, and get the click? Um, so, you know, we do a lot of testing on subject lines on mm-hmm. all the different attributes that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the first thing. But I think great image um, is is really important, and and frankly, part of the reason why I, I push our team on subject lines. If you've got more than half of your traffic, and in most businesses mm-hmm. that I've been in late, lately, seventy percent of emails 
are viewed on a mobile device. Yes. Well, if I have a subject line that pushes, you know, is, is too long and pushes the image down mm -hmm. where it can't be seen, you know, when the customer, you know, scans their emails, that is not a good email for me. I want to be able to have something compelling, some kind of an imagery that might get somebody's attention. And in the case of the Duncan and Saucony, mm -hmm. it caught my attention. Yeah. It's got to be short and sweet. And in this example, literally sweet with the donuts, but it can't push you down too far. And the other element of this campaign, which I like so much is another previous guest we had on uh, Drew Davis. He's got this concept called brandscaping. And it's basically, you know, in his book, he covers all these collaborations between brands that jointly, you know, did campaigns or launched something together. Um, and in this case, this is really a brandscape between three separate things with, with Duncan, with Saucony, with the Boston Marathon. And when you do that, it can be of interest to any of those audiences. So you got, you know, each of the brand's own fan bases, quote unquote. Um, but also you have more likelihood to just create buzz and bigger marketing buzz and break through the clutter that way as well. So they did a phenomenal brandscape here. And as you mentioned, this is a, their second time doing it. So clearly they've had some They've had some success with it, and what I like is that they they refreshed the shoe as well. They just didn't they didn't do the same shoe again. They made it a little different, and so this could be something that becomes an annual thing for them, and they can work in some other brands if they want, and they can keep mixing in different designs every year. So it's really you know, they provided some great legs for this campaign. No, uh, legs, shoes, ah, very yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> very, very yeah. Good. That, this whole interview was just for that one yeah. pun. So. <laughs> couple more kind of more fun random sections to wrap up here first one is called the unusual pet peeves quirks and weird talents so what's your biggest pet peeve oh boy people that should have high energy um that don't kind of people that are um, i'm a type a guy um, <laughs> i don't like sitting around doing nothing you know, I know we're all wired differently, but you know, right. there comes a moment in time when mm -hmm. you need to show that you have a sense of urgency and, and people that should, that don't, uh, that kind of is a pet peeve. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, totally get that. Yeah. It's frustrating when you see potential in someone in, in general and it's just, they don't take advantage of it. How about quirks? So is there anything that maybe your, your kids or your wife call you out for that maybe is a little bit quirky? And there's no shame in this. Everybody's got quirks and it's actually something we celebrate here on yeah, the podcast. It's, it's probably not a quirk as much as the fact that, um, you know, I need glasses to read. Yeah. Um, and Well, yeah, that's a common one. <laughs> and, and, and oftentimes uh, my son, um, if I'm looking at my phone and I don't have my glasses, he'll offer to hold it about six feet away from my uh, eyes. <laughs> um, so he thinks that I can see it then. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure it's a quirk, but yeah, gotcha. I, I, also I, I like order. I'm, I'm a, uh -huh. I'm a neat kind of guy. I'm a yeah. list kind of guy. Um, yeah. I need to, Oh, know. we love lists too. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, look at that. So you got a good plug there. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I need to, uh, kind of get my day in order, um, each day and, and know what I feel like I need to accomplish. And, um, so that's probably a little bit of quirky. Yeah. I get that too. There's, you know, if a, if a drawer, is out an inch or something, oh, yeah. but everything else you need, to, like need to push it back in. Can't leave cupboards open or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, if, the, if the, the picture on the wall is not straight, that's a absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's same. The dad side, my dad side of the family, especially my grandpa Fred, is that with everything. So I think part of that we have in, in my gene pool as well. <laughs> same, and how about weird talents? Is there anything that you're really good at but might not have so much use? So, for example. Like I can say the alphabet backwards really quickly. Uh, yeah. But no. Uh, yeah. I, I, no. I, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> no talent. No, just kidding. I, I saw you. I think I'm scared. <laughs> you had talked about that. Yeah. I don't know if I have that kind of a, of a quirky talent. You know, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I, I have something that I do that I would say that I excel mm -hmm. at. You know, I, I think I'm good at a bunch of things, but yeah. nothing that I've got that great talent. But it could be, I mean... When you were speaking earlier about being so good with numbers in the analytical world, maybe there's something in there that could be out there. But that, I take that back because that's not really something that has no use. That is good use for the business. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I can't do the alphabet so you, thing. I can't. I can't so you've, tie. You've a, won uh, this section. <laughs> right. I, I, I can't tie a uh, you know cherry. Oh, with your tongue. Cherry yes. with my tongue. Not one of those. Guys. Yeah, not too many people can. That's what. <laughs> 
All right, so only a little bit of time left here. I'd love to wrap up with some rapid-fire Q&A. You ready for it? Got it. All right, let's get wild. What's your favorite website? CNBC. All right. I know, that's a little weird. but No, it you know. could be anything. That's a weird talent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I know you're a baseball coach. What's your favorite memory from your coaching era? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, thank you. That, that's a great that's question. Strike three. Um, I will say when and being baseball coach spent most of that time, uh, other than the first year at T ball where it was co ed, mm-hmm. spent most of that time with my son Evan, and um, he was on a team, the Red Sox, um, which mm-hmm. was he great. played for the Boston Reds. <laughs> <I'm just gonna laughs> I wish, right? But he, he played for this team for the Red Sox two years in a row. We won our little World Series, and seeing how happy kids were. Yes, because they won, but mm-hmm. because they had a good time because I saw the worst kid on the team become better over time. That brought me great satisfaction. And and seeing parents that were happy, whether we won or lost, were happy about the fairness that they thought that I had displayed um, to their son mm-hmm. um, with equivalent playing time, even for the kids that were not as, as strong as the, the better players on the team. Um, I got great satisfaction out of that. Yeah, that's a, well, that's very powerful. I'm glad it was as fulfilling as, as as you would think. And congrats on the championships. I'm sure. I mean, we're sitting here in your dining room, and there are trophies everywhere. <laughs> no, but it, it's it's a ton of fun when you win something like that. And um, had to be pretty special coaching your son for for all those years yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, it w- it was great, and we coached a bunch of sports, and. But baseball has always been my my favorite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. It's my first love there. What's your favorite band of all time? E Street, uh, Springsteen, E Street mm-hmm. Band, um, by far. I'm not even sure there was a close second. <laughs> Is this New Jersey? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so you're a big golfer. Yes. You like to golf and then golf again after you golf? Absolutely. What's your favorite place or, or course that you've ever golfed at? Uh, I, I haven't... Well, I certainly haven't played as many courses as uh, as Cliff has played, that's for sure, though we've done a, a couple <laughs> of uh, golf trips. I, I have not played Pebble Beach. I would like to. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I would say that uh, uh, we, we played at uh, Pinehurst. And, um, you know, I think Pinehurst was a um, – we played the, the number two course there. Um, that was outstanding. Wow. Yeah, those are some. That's kind of a, a bucket list thing for any golfer. There. So, final question here, and this is this is a tough one. So, it started off some previous guests as I would do the same question every time, but it, a lot of the same answers came up. So, I'm going to put some restrictions on you. So, this is you're going through the gauntlet here. So, if you were stranded on an island and you could only have one object with you, but it can't be your cell phone, a laptop, or a book. What would it be? A picture of my wife, my two kids, my parents, um, and uh, my four grandparents that um, for a long time were a big part of uh, my life. So, you know, I I think family is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have a sister as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll pack that. We'll pack her in there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is one yeah. hell of a picture. <laughs> yeah, well, you got, you got to make sure you cover everybody. But uh, yeah, exactly. You know, family or extended family. Um, you know, I, I think that would be uh, you know something that would help mm-hmm. me to think back to uh, you know all the, the, the things that I've done. Yeah, and the time before you were on that damn island. But <laughs> but that's a really really nice answer. That you nailed it. I was I wasn't thinking of anything remotely close to that. You. Uh, well, I take that back because that makes me seem like not a family person. No, I'm just kidding. No, but you never know where these answers are going to come, right. and that's a very, very good answer. So we'll we'll start working on that picture that you know with uh, 47 people in it. Yes. <laughs> but thank you so much, Mark. Uh, th- this has been a blast. You know, connecting and again, thanks for hosting this this you know beautiful home here in Westfield. And Westfield's you. very close to my heart, and it's been so fun chatting about all these different things. Before we wrap up here, what's the best place for people to connect with you? Uh, they can get me at uh, on Twitter at MBF61. Uh, also on LinkedIn, uh, my uh, handle there, Mark B. Friedman. Get me there. Uh, also on Facebook, um, if they like. But um, you know, certainly they can feel free to reach out. Awesome. Cool. And now the stage is yours. If you want to end with a final quote or any final thoughts you want. Up to you how you want to wrap it up. 
Well, first of all, thanks very much. This was uh, a lot of fun. I, I enjoy uh, talking to uh, you know people that are trying to get content uh, out there. Of course. Uh, I, I did not know of your business uh, and your family's business uh, for a long time, despite my, my friendship with uh, with Cliff. Uh, you guys <laughs> have, have certainly you know made a great career out of this and are now evolving mm-hmm. um, you know your business a bit into more digital uh, initiatives. So that's great. Uh, so I'm, you know, happy to be able to support any business that is is reaching out to the consumer, mm-hmm. um, either with some what we might call old school tactics, but also, uh, you know, with uh, new school tactics. And then, you know, just back to the mentoring stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, really happy to help folks um, that feel like they have a need. Very easy to contact me, which we talked about. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've I've been known to uh, answer questions of folks um, just out of the blue people seem to think maybe i have something to share um, and and very happy to do that I, i would tend to agree with that mark the mentor thank you so much mark and shout out again to dana dana and uncle cliff thank you wild listeners for tuning in to another episode if you need some more business growth ideas and insights make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five star review on apple podcasts you can also take a peek at our business and marketing resources at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest and it's your weekly recap of creative marketing from all around the web. Finally, you can find us on your favorite social media platform at the handles HippoDirect and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!